Thank you for having me today. My name is Anna Gasco. I work at the Future Cities Laboratory, which is a research center on urbanization challenges by the ETH in Singapore, and we are funded by the National Research Foundation since 2010. Um, so today I come and present you the Grand Project, which is a project initiated by Chris Christiansen about a year and a half ago, and we are a team of six researchers based in time in Singapore. Uh, I come and present them today. So the, the Grand Project is a comparative research uh, project on comprehensively planned large-scale urban projects in Asia and in Europe, and these projects are implemented by complex public and private partnerships. Uh, our case studies based research include four cases in Asia and four cases in Europe. Um, so you have uh, uh, La Defense in Paris, Barcelona, we have 22 Act, in Tokyo we have Paranuchi, in Singapore we have the area of the downtown core of Marina de Sand, uh, in Shanghai we have the financial district of Zazi, in Hamburg we have the regeneration project of Aachen City, in Hong Kong we have the new West Colony Cultural District, and in London we have so I can um, say a bit more about the parameters of sampling um, So Grand Projet has become a major driver of uh, urbanization, but also of uh, development of new urban districts, particularly in places where the urban population is increasing drastically. And we have noticed that since the 1980s, these urban mega projects have increased not only in size but in numbers over the world. Uh, we have also noticed or eight case studies that there is a diversification in project drivers and in logic. If prior to the 1980s, Composite were mainly planned as business or as financial district, such as the Defense or Maranucci, they have now diversified their program or are planned from the beginning with diverse strategies, such as more mixed-use district, as the Hamilton City or Kings Cross, or the Cultural Quarter, as was found. Some of them even integrating more education and management as well. Um, due to their uh, sheer sizes, their long span of development time, the various phases they have to go through, the multiplicity of stakeholders that are involved, but also the specific governance and management that they require, Grand Projet require an, an elaborate solid framework of research, starting from the empirical analysis space, which is the one I'm going to present to today. So we have eight uh, main case studies that I've uh, introduced, uh, which are represented in red on this table, but we also included a series of reference case studies within the same urban region to understand how planning method had evolved within each city and what are the specificities of work in that case in comparison to these other reference case studies. So for example, if you look at London, we compare, I mean, we look at King's Cross uh, in comparison to kind of war, Broadgate, Paddington, and Battersea. Uh, just to mention London. Um, so this uh, study investigates how such projects are initiated, how they are conceived and then implemented, and how they influence their surrounding as well. So the empirical framework methodology focuses on process, on urban management, and on urban design. For process, we look at uh, challenges with governance, of course, but also temporal dimensions, which are facing, among um, many others. For urban management, we look at acquisition, land ownership, evolution. Uh, and for urban design, we look at how integrated the project is in terms of infrastructure, program, etc., among many other parameters. And as you can see, all these parameters are completely interrelated. It's very difficult to dissociate all of them. But ultimately, we are interested in the spatial dimension of it. Uh, but we do not only study how this project materializes materialize in space, but why it materializes in such so keeping in mind this um, empirical analysis framework, I will show you some of the progress on each individual case first, and then I will end the presentation with an output on the comparative methodology and its name, which we are currently working on. So looking at uh, processes, uh, for example, related to the phasing, uh, if you look at Hamburg and Athens City, uh, Hamburg has developed, uh, Athens City, sorry, has developed an, an elaborate and long-term phasing scheme stretched over 25 years, which ensures the viability of the individual development stages as well as the opportunity to learn with feedback, to learn from earlier phases and adapt to the changing needs such as integration of more social housing, for example. In King's Cross, and you all know it better than I do, uh, 
uh, the priority was to ensure the passive accessibility of the start of infrastructure. Infrastructure and public spaces were therefore uh, part of the, of the first phase uh, allowing integration into the, into the surrounding area. On, for the Zadzwe, on the other end, uh, in Shanghai, the project grew very rapidly with a given priority to cars due to the infrastructure scale, the non functional land use, and the large plots of development occupied by one high rise each, the urban framework is very rigid and adaptable. This is clear with the need for the recent construction of overpasses to get to the pedestrian network. The construction of Kujazui from the 90s onward was meant to put Shanghai on the world map with a CBD that was aiming to compete on the international scale. Forty years after the Defense was built, the French planner were hired to advise on the construction of the model of the composure in China resulting in a non-functional and anachronistic project, which has difficulties that explain the needs of contemporary urban life. So moving to examples related to urban management, um, and looking specifically at the land ownership of the public land, we see that despite urbanization, land owners have specific arrangements in the modern context. So looking at London, uh, we see complex public and private partnership, which evolve over time, of course, but also through space, since that corner now comes from the different geographical location of the global economy. And when over 50% of the piece of land in central London becomes owned by a historic pension fund or the Qatar Investment Authority, just to cite a few, question related to change of management of privately owned public space needs to be carefully managed to the opportunities. In Tokyo, on the other hand, the, the process remains, that process of land ownership remains very local. The land is usually owned by one of the main Japanese employers, such as Mitsubishi, just to cite one of them, which is the main landowner of the Marimuchi estate, which is the oldest of the In Shanghai, uh, similarly, despite the appearance of globalized built environment, the developer origin of many of the buildings are products of the Chinese art through state owned enterprises, or private Chinese enterprises with strong state backing. Um, in Paris, under that, I'm sorry, uh, the France grew over several phases of development from the 1950s onwards, one of the purposes. Under a public body that was specifically created for that, which is called the, which is called the, 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 and the defense had, had defined its raison d'etre through direct links to the city of Paris and to the civil government, completely neglecting the surrounding to which it was physically, physically located. In 2010, the EPAD was enlarged to include the development of the larger territory, depending on the spew or effects of the business quarter. It's now called the Padesa, and it's charged with developing, in consultation with local authorities, an area which is around 560. So to end with urban design, and I will only show you one example, so uh, looking at Singapore, uh, so Singapore is a tropical island, it's located two degrees uh, north of the equator, the weather is a balance between uh, heavy downpours of rain, but uh, as well extremely hot and humid climate. And as a result, the underground pedestrian network of links open spaces connecting the different metro stations with the basements of the building is quite a specific dimension to this space study. So to encourage the realization of such an urban network, the developer can apply for cash grants or add additional money generating activities in the surrounding spaces for additional um, So for um, each of the cases, we are approaching the end of the empirical analysis, which I've shown in the very small part today. For example, one topic that I have heard was omitted is uh, governance, because I'm sure you will speak about it uh, much better than I do, but uh, it's nevertheless a very important aspect in the research. Uh, and in that aspect, the other reference case that would be the city region of very So when you look at this cross and I report what are the kinds of governance related to the policy that we're is how it has changed how it is. We, we, we look at that as well, but I haven't uh, talked about it today. Um, so, um, a more important phase in our research has started, which is how to make sense of the case studies knowledge by developing the framework of comparison. 
So we will compare the cases across geographical divides and from a set of comparative perspectives to distill common or opposing lessons without comparing the incomparable. So we cannot compare things from Austria to Dunham or Singapore, obviously. But looking from these lenses of comparison, we will focus on the spatial dimension again of each viewpoint without going into detail since we are currently developing it. Um, this comparative methodology, the lenses that try to capture at the moment the project budget uh, within their own CPO, um, how their implementation is reflecting distributive power constellations, how adaptive the projects are to the changing conditions, and finally, what are the implications of the project on the scale of the neighborhood, but also the urban region, and then the rural region. So, under those lenses, we can look at different parameters in each project. So examine under this set of perspectives, Mont Projet will be a distinctive uh, localized stakeholder network, yet creating a global project output. We can also observe a trend away from a static design approach towards a strategic and a more open-ended one, which increases the capacity to adopt new urban policies and to adapt to changing needs. It is in this multidimensional analysis that we can see Mont Projet as physical manifestation of geopolitical processes, with a distinctive and specific impact on 